Our next speaker is Michael Curran from Oxford, who speaks on subset structure size and Earhart theory. Michael, please. Thanks for the invitation again. Today, I'm happy to be speaking about some joint work with Leo Goldmacher. And today, I'm going to be talking about relations between the structure and size of iterated subsets, connections with that structure, and Earhart theory, which is the theory of connecting the theory of counting lattice points in integral polytopes. So let's begin. Here we go. So the setup we'll have is we're going to take A to be a finite subset of Z to the D. And the object we're going to be studying is the H fold iterated sum set. We'll note this by HA. And this consists of exactly the sum of H elements of your set A. And It'll be convenient later on to set 0a equal to the set just containing 0. And we'll see why that's useful in a bit. So the question we're asking here today is, given some fixed set or some fixed subset of z to the d, what can we say about the structure of this set or its size as h grows larger and larger? So the starting point for this research was a very general theorem due to Havansky, which states that given any finite subset A of an abelian semigroup, which is the most general setting where you can talk about iterated sum sets. What Havansky proved is that there is some polynomial with rational coefficients such that the size of HA agrees with P of H exactly as long as you're willing to wait for sufficiently large H. However, in this theorem, we don't actually have any explicit bound on what sufficiently large is. So the questions we take away from this theorem are, what can we say about this polynomial P of X? And can we quantify or give some explicit bound on what sufficiently large means? And finally, is there some structure analog of this theorem that describes the structure of HA as H grows to infinity? Okay, so to build our intuition, here's an example of a subset of Z2. We have these four points and Let's look what happens to our sum set as we add A to itself more and more times. So if we look at 5A, we have essentially a dilated copy of A with some integer points in the interior of this region. And as we add more and more, we see a similar pattern and we fill in more and more of the interior of this convex shape except we have some holes towards the boundary that persist as we get, as we take H larger and larger. However, as we'll see, more and while more and more fills up towards the interior, this, these persistent holes near the boundary have a pattern that stays essentially the same and we can, and this persists and is almost periodic for all H as H keeps growing. Okay. So let's think about what this implies about Havansky's theorem. So we've seen as H gets large, HA fills in a triangle. This triangle is the convex hole of A, which going forward, I'll denote by delta sub A. And what we've seen is that HA is the convex hole of A dilated by H with many points filled in. So what does this make us predict? Well, we would predict P of H to be a quadratic polynomial and the leading coefficient should be the area of the convex hole of A. And it turns out that this type of result is true in general. There's just one small caveat and that we need to assume A is reduced or normalized in some set so that we don't have too many persistent holes in our sum set. The prototypical example here is just the simple set. A is zero, two, four. And in this case, since all our elements are even, we won't have any odd elements. So if we look between zero and four H, we'll have about half as many elements as we would expect based on this earlier heuristic. Okay, so based on this assumption, what Havansky actually proved was we take a finite subset A, we specialize the site case that A is a subset of Z to the D, and we have a normalizing assumption that the difference set A minus A generates Z to the D additively then we can say more that in fact, this polynomial guaranteed by Havansky's theorem has degree D and the leading coefficient is equal to the volume of the convex hole of A. 
However, while we do have some information on what P is, it doesn't give us any information or any explicit bound on what sufficiently large means in this case. And that's largely what Leo and I were interested in. Even in the simple case where D is equal to one, this problem is closely related to the classical Frobenius coin problem. It wasn't until very recently that we had sharp bounds on, sufficient, on sufficiently large H in this theorem. And that was proven last year in a paper by Granville and Walker. One of the things they showed was that if we take A to be a finite subset of Z, normalize to have minimum element zero, maximum element B, and normalized with all the greatest common divisor uh, equal to one, then a, a consequence of what they proved is that the cardinality of HA is linear in H whenever H is greater than or equal to B minus the cardinality plus two. And this result is essentially sharp and doesn't look like it can be improved very much in general. Weaker bounds here were known previously due to work of Nathanson, there was work of Wu Chen and Chen, and Last year, some interesting work due to Granville and Shaken. Okay. Now, Granville and Walker didn't just prove a, a theorem about the eventual size of HA, they proved a theorem about the eventual structure of HA. And this theorem had been known in the previous works I had mentioned earlier, just with slightly weaker bounds on sufficiently large. So, to say what they proved, we need to define what's called an exceptional set. So, given a subset of Z, define E of A to be the set of N greater than or equal to zero so that N does not lie in H A for any H greater than or equal to one. And this just consists of the integers N such that N isn't a sum of elements of A. So it's natural to expect that any element of this exceptional set can't be in your iterated sum set for any H. And what they managed to prove is that if we look at our iterated sum set HA under these same normalization assumptions, then HA consists of all the points between zero and HB, except for some points near the boundary point zero or the endpoint zero corresponding to the exceptional set of A. And we're also missing some points near the endpoint HB. And the points we're missing there correspond to the exceptional set of B minus A. And this holds for all H greater than or equal to B minus the cardinality of A plus two. And the way I like to think about this is that these exceptional sets E of A and E of B minus A take into account local obstructions near each of the endpoints of your set to writing elements as an, uh, to writing a, a fixed integer as an element of your sum set. And the content of this theorem says effectively that for large H, those are the only obstructions to writing an element as an element of your subset. Okay. And in fact, in a paper last year, Granville and Shaken proved the same structure theorem in higher dimensions, only their proof wasn't effective for dimensions greater than or equal to two. Okay. So now I'll mention what Leo and I were able to prove. So if we take a finite subset of Z to the D, such that the different set generates Z to the D additively. And we further have to assume here that the convex hull of A is a D simplex. So in other words, the convex hull of A has D plus one vertices. In one dimension, this just means the convex hull is a triangle. In two dimensions, this means the convex hull is a tetrahedron and so on. And what we were able to prove here was that Havansky's theorem holds with an explicit bound on what sufficiently large means. So this equality holds the size of HA is PH whenever H is greater than the volume of the convex hull of A times D plus one factorial minus three D minus one. All right. And we were actually able to do a bit better when the set A is, is small. So if instead we assume that the cardinality of A is equal to the dimension plus two, I think we can actually get an exact formula for the cardinality of HA. So for large h, h greater than or equal to the volume of a times d factorial minus d minus one, we can write the cardinality of h a just as a difference of two binomial coefficients. And what's perhaps more surprising about our method is that we can actually deduce the cardinality of a h a for small h. So we can actually give a formula as just a simple binomial coefficient for h between 
zero and this transition point. And one thing I'll note between these two results is that in our general theorem, we have something of shape d plus one factorial times the volume. Whereas in this example, we have something that's just d factorial plus the times the volume of the convex hull. And we believe the optimal result or what the truth is, is that Havansky's theorem actually holds whenever h is greater than the volume times d factorial and that our results here are off from what's optimal by a factor of d plus one. And I'll say a little bit towards the end of the talk about why that factor of d plus one shows up. Okay. And now finally, I'll talk about the effective structure theorem. So given a finite subset of eight, given a finite subset of z to the d, whose convex hull is a d simplex. So in the one dimensional case, we had obstructions near the two endpoints of our interval. The higher dimensional analog of this is obstructions near the vertices of our convex hull. So if we let V be the set of our vertices of A, then what we can do is we can write HA to be an intersection over all our vertices of these sets here with an explicit bound on what sufficiently large means, where again, we have something of the form D plus one factorial times the volume of the convex hull of A. And this is the same result as in granville shaken just made effective. So to make sense of what this set here is, I'll point out this union here corresponds to the complement of our exceptional sets. So these are all the elements possible, to the, all the elements that you can possibly write as a positive linear combination of the elements of A plus V. So in, a, in, account, in effect, this is saying, these are the elements where there's not an obstruction to writing an element as an element of the subset near that vertex. So as long as there are no local obstructions to writing a given point as an element of HA near all of the vertices, then we can, then in fact, that element needs to be an element of HA as long as H is sufficiently large. So in other words, the local obstructions are the only obstructions after H gets big enough. Okay, so the inspiration for this work is, comes from what's called Earhart theory. And the question Earhart theory asks is given some fixed d-dimensional polytope whose, whose vertices have integer coefficients, how many lattice points can you find in that polytope P or in that polytope dilated by a factor of two or that polytope dilated by a factor of T where T is any integer? And the interesting result uh, Eugene Earhart was able to prove was that much like Havansky's theorem, there exists a polynomial with rational coefficients such that the number of lattice points in P dilated by some integer T coincides exactly with this polynomial P evaluated at T. And this holds for all T greater than or equal to one. So this shows some similarity to some similarities to Havansky's theorem, only we no longer have this sufficiently large condition and it holds for all t, assuming t is an integer. While this doesn't actually apply, imply anything about Havansky's theorem, this analogy and the method of proof of Earhart's theorem turns out to be very useful for studying some sets. So I'll talk about that method through an example. So the set we're gonna be working with is the set zero, one, five, and six. And the idea behind our work here and Earhart's theorem is we take A and we lift it to another dimension. So what we're going to do is for each H, we're going to plot the set HA at height H in Z2. So at height zero, we plot zero A, which is just zero. At height one, we plot A. At height two, we plot two A and so on. Okay. We haven't done too much yet. In order to get a hand on the cardinality, what we'll do next is to each point in this cone, which we'll call CA, we'll associate a polynomial weight. So to each X in CA, attach a weight of T to the height of, H, of X. And T here is just some formal variable, which we'll think of as a coefficient of a power series. Okay, so here's a picture of our cone with the weights attached. So here zero, we'll have weight one, all the points at height one will have weight t, the points at height two will have weight t squared, and so on. 
And now we want to take all these weights and combine them compactly into a single object. So what we'll do is we'll create a generating series, CA of T. And this will just be the sum of all points X in CA of the weight of X. So the sum of T to the height of X. And because the cone CA consists of a copy of HA at height H, this generating series CA of T is equal to the sum of all H greater than or equal to zero, the cardinality of HA times T to the H. So it's just the ordinary power series generating function of the size of HA. And our strategy now becomes, can we find a different expression for CA of T and then use that different expression to deduce information about the cardinality of HA? And the idea here is we want to order by column now instead of by row. So let's first look at the points of CA lying above the residue class 0 mod 6. So here, these points are colored in red. And these points actually have a very nice, simple structure. And we can add, if we call this set of points S0 and associate a generating function S0 of t, we can just sum by column by column. So we get 1 plus t plus t squared and so on for the first column. We get that same expression shifted up one, so multiplied by t in the second column, and so on. And we can evaluate this directly just using the geometric series formula. This is going to be equal to 1 over 1 minus t quantity squared. OK. And if we look at the next residue class, points lying above 1 mod 6, we get a very similar story. If we look. S0 or S1 here, the set of points lying above 1 mod 6, that's exactly equal to S0 translated up 1 and to the right 1. And since we're translating up to the right and our weights only are up 1 and our weights only encode the height, the generating series for S1 is going to be equal to T times the generating series of S0. And that's exactly equal to T over 1 minus T squared. Okay, so those two residue classes are relatively simple. But it is possible that some residue classes can be a bit more complicated. And that's what happens when we look over the points lying above 2 mod 6. So now we don't have a simple translate of the set S0, but we have two what I'll call minimal elements, one here at 2 comma 2 and one here at 20 comma 4. And while it's not quite as simple as the first two situations, it's still manageable because these two sets, if we look at this set, S2 is a translate of two copies of S0. And their intersection here at this peak is just another copy of S1 that shifted. So we can actually compute this as long as we're going to do a bit of inclusion exclusion. And in this case, we have S2 is the union of S0 shifted by this minimal element 2, 2. S0 shifted by this minimal element 20, 4. And their intersection is S0 shifted by this peak 20, 5. So if we add the weights of these two minimal elements and subtract the weight of this peak, we'll get the generating series function or the generating series of S2 now. So this will be t squared corresponding to this minimal element, t to the fifth corresponding to this minimal element. And finally, we're subtracting t to the fifth corresponding to this minimal element. And it turns out this is essentially as complicated as it gets. You might have more multiple elements or more, you might have multiple minimal elements, but you can still handle these using a simple inclusion exclusion scheme. So if we take now all of these residue classes and add them up from zero to five, what we get is some rational function in T. And by some elementary manipulations, we can take this and write this as a Taylor expansion, as a power series in T. Now, thinking back to where we started, we defined C sub A of T so that it would be the generating series of the cardinality of HA. So just by equating coefficients here, as long as we don't have these three outer terms interfering with the coefficients. We can just say the cardinality of HA is equal to the simple linear polynomial 6H plus 1. And this holds whenever H is greater than or equal to 4. So this gives us a method from analyzing the structure of this cone to deducing our structure theorem and also 
using the power series to, to deduce an effective version of Havatsky's theorem. Okay. So now I'll say a bit about the general case to wrap up. So here we took a subset of Z and lifted it to Z to the D plus one. And the general case is essentially the same. We take a subset of A of Z to the D and lift it to a subset of Z to the D plus one, creating a cone where this cone consists of copies of HA at height H for all H greater than or equal to zero. The next step was to break into residue classes. And this is where the assumption that the convex hole of A needs to be a simplex comes in. Because if we want to break into residue classes, we're going to need to mod out by the vertices. However, if there are more than D plus one vertices, they can't be linearly independent in Z to the D plus one. And the proof starts to break down. But if you do have D plus one vertices, then everything works out and you can do this process in the same exact manner. So for any fixed residue class, we saw we'll get some shape that looks like this. We'll have some set of points consisting of translates of some simple cone and we'll have minimal elements, which I'll label here in blue, and peaks, which I'll label here in red. And we saw that the generating series C A of T can be written as the sum of the weights of the minimal elements minus the sum of the weights of the peaks, all divided by one minus T to the dimension. And then we can use some power series theory to deduce information about the cardinality of H. So, the question is now, how do we bound these peaks? And how do we bound these minimal elements? It turns out that bounding the peaks is actually quite difficult and we don't have a very good way to do it. But bounding the minimal elements is not so bad. So what we can show is that if we denote by capital H, the maximum peak height of all of the residue classes. So in this case, the maximum peak height in this residue class would be this point here. Then what we can prove is that the cardinality of HA stabilizes, or Havonsky's theorem holds, for H, little h, greater than capital H minus D. And we can also show that our structure theorem holds, or the structure of HA stabilizes, whenever little h is greater than or equal to capital H minus 1. OK? And to bound this, what we do is we relate capital H to the heights of these minimal elements. And these minimal elements are actually things that can be studied using relatively standard techniques in additive combinatorics. The height of these minimal elements are related to what's called Davenport's problem, which concerns how long, given some abelian group, how long of a sum you can, can you have such that none of those subsums are equal to zero in that group. And we can get decent bounds for this. It turns out in in Leo's and my paper, we use very, very, very trivial bounds for the heights of these minimal elements. You can do better with a bit of work, and it turns out that has been done now in a recent paper of Granville, Walker, and Shaken. But the fact that we're only using the minimal elements instead of these peaks, that's where this extra factor of D plus one off of optimality comes in. So what we do is we say we can bound the minimal elements and then worst case scenario, what is, the, what is the highest peak height? And that's where the extra factor of D plus one comes in. If you wanna get rid of that factor of D plus one, you'll have to work directly with how can we control the heights of these peaks? But at the moment, we don't know of a very good way to do that. So that's where, that's where our problem leaves off going forward. And that's where we think that's where we think we think these peak heights are the next natural question to ask going forward. So I'll stop there. I think I think you might be muted. I'm unmuted. So I there. said first, thank you, Michael, for your talk. Um, thank you. I asked if there are any questions. And then I said, I actually have a couple of questions. So Certainly. you have on the one hand, the Earhart polynomial. Uh, and on the other hand, you have the Havansky polynomial. And they have the same degree and the same leading term coefficients. 
but do you know anything more about either the coefficients of the Chavansky polynomial or how it's related to the Earhart polynomial? So it is, it is a bit difficult. So in the case of Earhart polynomials, we actually know a bit more. We can find, we can find the, a coefficient of the term of degree d minus one. And that's deduced from a result called Earhart reciprocity. And we worked a little bit trying to find an analogy of that to see if we could deduce some information about the coefficients of the Havansky polynomial, but it didn't seem to go anywhere in re the reciprocity theory didn't seem to work very well. The, let's see where it was. The, the key issue that comes up is that when we write out this power series here, or when we write out C A of T as a rational generating function, when we're proving Havansky's theorem, the, this numerator here, the degree always stays less than the degree of the denominator. So that when you do an expansion as a power series, you don't have these, these first three or more terms appearing before the general summation here. So these, these terms out front make, make it a lot harder to understand the, the Havansky polynomials in general. Right. So also a lot of the work that uh, you did and Andrew and, and several others has yeah. to do with not so much the structure of the iterated sum set, but the, uh, uh, the point at which uh, the structure comes in and stabilizes. Uh, yes. So I'm curious whether uh, there are um, any uh, applications of this in which knowing the point at which the stability uh, begins is important. I'm not sure. I can tell you, if you look at this figure, the point at which the stability comes in is essentially one point short of the of this peak height. But I'm not exactly sure in what cases of applications it's useful to know that. Other questions for our, oh wait, in the Q&A. So if you, uh, Michael, if you can look at the Q&A, there are three questions. Good, okay, can't seem, can't seem so to So the first is, it. do you have any idea about the computational complexity of calculating your minimal elements? I believe it's polynomial time complexity. And uh, suppose, the second question is if you have A and B uh, finite sets of lattice points, um, what can be said about uh, the function f of PQ, which is the size of PA plus QB? So you're looking at a sort of like this linear form in A and B. Yeah, our method hasn't been used to handle, handle linear forms yet. I believe in some work done by by Nathanson and maybe Rusha, they handled that back when they proved their, when they gave a combinatorial proof of Kavansky's theorem. I believe some results are known then, but we haven't used our approach to show anything in that direction. So the, um, uh, so for linear forms and finite sets of lattice points, uh, there's a theorem that I proved that uses, um, you know, some commutative algebra, Hilbert polynomials. And then a special case of that, there's a more elementary proof of uh, Rouge and me. Um, but okay. Our proof here is actually commutative algebra just in disguise. Yeah, it's all the same. I mean, <laughs> commutative algebra is just combinatorics. Uh, and then there's a third question. Uh, can you show the formula with the binomial coefficients again uh, sure. for when the size of A is D plus two? Uh, here we go. Oh, and a lead has a uh, actually uh, a lead. Uh, you can talk now. Why don't you just ask or state your comment and? Uh, all I was saying about just uh, leading on from what uh, Michael uh, was saying about trying to work out some other coefficients of the Skavansky polynomial. Um, in the paper with Andrew and George, 
in the simplex case, we worked out the subleading coefficient of the Kavansky polynomial in terms of certain data regarding these minimal elements that Michael talked about. But whether or not that's actually an illuminating description, I'm not so sure. Yeah. So when you expand this power series, effectively what you get is you can expand the Kavansky polynomial as a sum of binomial coefficients, and then you can re-expand those in terms of combinations of Sterling polynomials, where the coefficients depend on these minimal elements and these p-cuts. Okay, let me thank the speaker again, and we will move on in a minute or two to talk by James Muir. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.